Okay. Yeah, it's working. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, now we now we can start. Bit late, but better late than never. All right. Um. Let's see. Let's get some questions going. Um. Let's wait. All right. Um. I'm gonna have. I'm. I'm gonna wait for some questions to start flowing in. But um. Uh. I have some questions for you. What would you? I shoot. Really, t- I, I usually wait for the people to ask questions, but uh, what would you say the best book is to start when reading your books? Because I know you're a very profound author, author with your with your with your many books, like you, yeah. Which book? I suppose the best one. No, no, I can't comment on which is the best. Perhaps the most interesting would be Radical Coup. Okay. That's a book I published, I think, back in 2019, just before the world turned completely upside down and went stark staring mad, in which I, I, I try to explain that England, America, and certain other parts of the West had been taken over by a new kind of ruling class, an utterly malign ruling class, and that the only way to get rid of these people is to identify them and to shut them down. And you shut them down by shutting down all those areas of the state administration that they have sadly colonised. Right. You do this not because it will bring about an, a, a libertarian revolution, though of course it will, which makes it worth doing in itself, but simply because... It destroys the enemy class. It gets this great vampire class off our backs. A vampire class who are not simply sucking all of our money out of us, which is something that would upset libertarians, of course, but because they are destroying us as a nation. So radical coup available on Amazon and in all other good bookshops. All right. Yeah. Okay. That 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 uh, um, sorry, um, that is the book I actually got from you. Mm. So, I was. So tell yeah, me, tell me, is this a radio or does it have video attached? This is video attached. Yes. Oh right. Okay. Well, I'll try to look um a little more with it. <laughs> I know it's I've light got, and everything for you. Yeah. All right, I've I've got a question for him, um, Mr. Gap. Uh, One of our viewers wants to know, uh, because a lot of our viewers are actually American, he wants to know how you feel about President Trump as opposed to President Biden. I think of Donald Trump much as many of my American friends do. He ran a wonderful election campaign. He pressed every conceivable button. He was going to drain the swamp. He was going to shut down large areas of the enemy class. He would even begin prosecutions of those people who were the more um, outstanding criminals in recent American history. He was going to pull out of NATO, or at least insist that NATO should be a rather less ambitious and imperialist organization. There'd be no more wars. There would be quite a few of the good things that all libertarians, all good libertarians at least, want. And then once he was in office, he broke those promises. He broke them for a number of reasons. One is that he may not have taken the promises terribly seriously when he was campaigning for president, but the other reason is because he had no idea of how to do it. He never knew how to produce the follow through to his promises. He also had no concept of delegating. He had no no understanding of the need to get a group of committed, loyal supporters around him who who would do his will. Now, obviously, the... The anti-Trump people have for years now been comparing Donald Trump to Adolf Hitler, but making every possible reservation and insisting up front, I am not comparing Donald Trump to Adolf Hitler. 
Let's see how Hitler achieved his revolution, a revolution which I'm freely willing to say was a thoroughly evil thing, but I'm talking in the purely technical sense. How did Hitler bring about a fundamental transformation of German life after 1933? And the answer is not by micromanagement of the revolutionary process. What Hitler excelled in doing was finding loyal subordinates and not giving those people detailed instructions. People are told all the way down the chain of command, don't bother asking the Fuhrer for advice. He won't give it. What you must ask yourselves is what would the Fuhrer do if he were in your place? You must help to govern Germany by working towards the Fuhrer. Don't ask him what you should do. Ask yourself, what would the Fuhrer do in your place? And by doing that, Hitler was able to set his own revolution in Germany, very much on autopilot, while he devoted himself to the more exciting pursuits of invading his neighbours or getting ready to invade them. Now, that is what Donald Trump should have done. Look at the kind of people he's, look at the kind of people he brought around him. John Bolton. Now, what on earth persuaded a man with vaguely isolationist tendencies to appoint such a creature to high office, someone who's never seen a war he didn't love. That, that's where Donald Trump went wrong. He was long on promises, but brutally short on delivery. And his legacy, his legacy is disastrous. He ran for president in a system which was corrupt, but ordinarily corrupt. The the real ruling class in America did not openly bias the electoral process against him. But once he got in, these people realised that there was a weakness. It was possible for a rich man to say all the right things, get the proles to vote for him, and then get himself into the highest office in the land. And so they set about making sure that this would not happen again. And they seem to have done rather a good job of this. So that's what I think of Donald Trump. As for President Biden, well, it seems to be a cliche among people who don't like him that he's senile. And he does seem to be not entirely up to the job. But it was never intended that he should be up to the job. He's just some, he's just some elderly white man who wanders around smiling and waving. Um, and that's all that's needed. The people behind the scenes, they will run things. Whether or not he's asleep, he falls asleep in meetings, so what? He doesn't make the decisions. He's just a front man. He's exactly what the American ruling class wants. Right. All right. Um, Thank you. Uh, Next question comes from another user. Uh, this question is, in an ideal world, how free would the markets be? And in verse, what would the banking situation look like uh, in, in your ideal world? Sorry, not in an ideal world, in your ideal world. In my ideal world, banking, banks, banks, of course, would exist. They would take in deposits from the public and they would lend money out to anyone willing and able to borrow and presumably to pay back. There would not be a central bank, or if there were to be a central bank, it would be tied to a fully redeemable gold standard, the sort of thing that uh, Rothbard wanted. What would the market look like? I don't think it's a very good idea for governments to involve themselves in the day-to-day -day running of markets. I think it would, I, in my ideal world, there'd be no governments telling us what the minimum price of cigarettes or alcohol should be. There'd be very few taxes and there'd be none of this talk of merit and demerit goods. 
we'd be allowed to make our own choices with our own money. Now, does that mean that I believe in total uncompromising laissez-faire? Yes, at the national level, I do. Do I believe in total and uncompromising freedom of trade? Yes, I do, but maybe not yet. Let's imagine if, if your people, if the Americans were to undergo some kind of libertarian revolution, America is still just about, for the moment, the richest and most powerful country in the world, for the moment, just about. But England isn't. And so if we were to have any kind of libertarian takeover in my country, we would face a world as hostile to us as it is to North Korea and to allow unrestricted flows of goods and cash into and out of the country might not be such a good idea. It would, be, it would not be a, a product of the free choice of ordinary people. It would be directed to, to a particular purpose. And so it might be necessary in the first instance for a libertarian revolutionary government outside the United States to regard the rest of the world with a certain suspicion. Depends on circumstances, of course. It depends completely right. on circumstances. But the, um, uh, there are some libertarians who would say, under no circumstances would I ever interfere in the workings of a free market. Well, I admire that. But if you have to choose between a short-term intervention and the prospect of losing the whole revolution, well, I'm afraid I'm a pragmatist. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I had a question. Um, what are your thoughts on Brexit and how did that affect like the libertarian, any kind of libertarian upbringing in the UK? Brexit has very little to do with libertarianism. I was for many years a red hot anti-European, but that's that's because I am a bit of an English nationalist. I was not under any I was not under any illusion that England was inherently more free or more inclined to libertarianism than other countries in Europe. Indeed, for a while, I did, for a while I rather sold out on leaving the European Union. I accepted that it was not likely to happen in the near future. It also was not terribly important. And it was a diversion of effort. Then we had the, ref then we had the referendum, and then the Brexit is won. And so, immediately Brexit became worth demanding, not because it was in itself the libertarian revolution, but because it was a symbol. If the ruling class, which didn't want Brexit, which of course made it worth having in the end, but if the ruling class got its way and managed to cancel Brexit, that would be a victory against ordinary people. And so the ruling class needed to be defeated, and so we needed to have Brexit, and that is what we got. But I did not expect that leaving the European Union would be followed immediately by a large-scale recovery of our freedoms. I must admit, I didn't expect that leaving the European Union would be immediately followed by two years of a therapeutic police state, but that's another matter. But um, to, to summarise, Brexit is not a libertarian thing, but it is an important symbol, an important stepping stone towards a libertarian future. Or rather not is, but can be, put it that way. All right. Another question we have 
from one of our users is, did the policies enacted by the British government during World War I affect the oncoming of the Great Depression? Short answer is, I don't know. Another short answer is, yes, everything that happened before the Great Depression affects its oncoming. It is, it's difficult to understand exactly what brought about the Great Depression. The, the Keynesian claim that it was a deficiency of purchasing power strikes me as not very convincing. The purely Austrian view that it was all an effect of the credit expansion in America during the middle 1920s also strikes me as unlikely because this is something that's happened repeatedly and not been followed by a gigantic worldwide economic crash. I think the effect of the Great War was to destabilize the world economy as it existed before 1914. It was never fully stabilized and there was a gradual and often unrecognized transfer of power from London to New York. That plus a number of unresolved imbalances that came about as a result of the Great War, I suppose contributed to the Great Depression, but this is something that is beyond my full understanding. Right. I can well understand that credit expansion during the middle 1920s led to a stock market crash in New York in 1929. But what then brought about the global crash in 1931, that this long process, this radical deflation? I, no, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I would have to, uh, you know, there, there's probably so many intangible uh, factors that it's really hard to quantify it exactly. Um, and, and actually point such factors out. Um, yeah. I'd say probably the overarching um, answer would just be uh, the more kind likely likingness to a modern economy, such as like, like you said, Keynesianism. But I'd mm -hmm. say another one overall was just radicalization in the people and also their po political structures. Um, but th again, those are just such umbrella terms that it doesn't really mean anything. No. Right, exactly. No, what I would say is that the Great Depression is something that seems mostly to have affected the United States and right. those countries which were in the American orbit. The, the Depression was over in Britain by the early part of 1933, after which there was almost uninterrupted growth right through until the beginning of the war. Right. The, the full horrors of that depression were felt in America <laughs> and in those countries which were plugged into the American economy, perhaps Japan. Right, yeah. yeah. Uh, Duncan, do you have a question? Um, I'm trying to think of one real quick. Um... I can I can ask one then. Okay. Uh, because I've got another one from our user. Okay. And this one's a fairly easy one. And I think you might have touched on it a bit uh, already when you were talking about the free market, but uh, it would be nice to have a more direct answer. How can the free market provide public goods? Public goods. Are you talking of public goods in the technical sense? I'm Thinking is so because he wouldn't have stated otherwise. Very well. One of the, if you look through most economics textbooks, not something I do lately because economics is not my subject nowadays. Right. But if you look through an economics textbook, you'll be told that a radio station, for example, is a good instance of a public good. It is not excludable and non-rivalrous. And right. I always found this a rather, I always found this a rather silly argument indeed, since the writers of economics textbooks are men usually of considerable ability, I've often suspected it was argument in bad faith. 
Right. If you assume that the customer and supply relationship is between the broadcaster and the receiving public, then yes, mm -hmm. we are. Leave aside modern digital technology, we are looking at a good which is non excludable and non rivalrous. But of course, the customer supply relationship is not between those two parties, it is between the advertisers and the broadcaster. The, right, right. the consumers are simply part of what is supplied to the customer. Mm. And if you look at it that way, then radio and television broadcasting are in no sense public goods. National defence, now that is a public good. And you can talk about armed citizen militias, private defence contractors, you can talk about those all you like, but when you live in a world of states, if you do not have some kind of military deterrence, you will probably be invaded, especially if you make yourself obnoxious to other ruling classes by having a libertarian revolution. If, for example, you want to be like, let's think of somewhere that is completely innocuous as far as its neighbours is concerned. Let's say Mexico, which I suppose is a bit of a nuisance in the sense that it sends large numbers of people across the Rio Grande mm. and is rather dangerous to visit at times. But there are very few, it's difficult to talk about anything in Mexico which is an existential threat to the American ruling class. And so there's no reason to invade Mexico. If Mexico, right. however, were to go through a libertarian revolution and abolish all controls on drugs and were to, were to bring in a policy of absolute uncompromising freedom of speech so that Twitter and Facebook relocated south and, well, you, you can fill in the blanks for all the other measures of this Mexican libertarian revolution, then right. it find itself invaded by the biggest military in the history of the world. And to talk of an armed citizen militia, that does go some way because these things can be quite effective, but no, you need to have you need to have some kind of national defense, and that is non-rivalrous, non-rivalrous, it is not excludable. Mm -hmm. And in a world of states, I'm afraid you need to have a state to provide at least national defense. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, I'd have to. I'd have to definitely agree with that on the uh, definitely on the regard of uh, national defense. Yeah. But most m most of the public goods we're told about in the textbooks are a bit of a fraud because they're not public goods; they're private goods. It's just right. a question of. It's a question of how you, it's a question of where you go looking for the supplier and the consumer. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, thank you. Um, I have a question now. Um, what would be, all right. So I've asked this question a couple of times, other guests before. I, I know you, I don't know if you actually did go back and watch those videos that I told you to, like, if you glance through, if you'd like to see what we're doing here. Um, but, um, what kind of like let's say a country is manipulating their the economy and they're a big enough country where they just where they cause problems for the rest of the world what could we do as as a big country like let's say the us do against them to like with free trade being like the main policy um so give me let, let's clarify your question. You're talking about a smaller country which is manipulating certain things, such as like the the economy, like like basically like taking. Let's say they have a rare good, and they only they have that good, and they're making it very expensive for everybody else to buy. It depends on circumstances. Let us imagine. Let's imagine that the. the Let's imagine that the global suppliers of oil were to join in some kind of cooperative movement which set production quotas on each member with the purpose of raising the short-term and the long-term price of oil. 
Mm -hmm. What should be done about that? And the answer is nothing. Nothing at all. And I don't think I need to argue for that. But let's now take an extreme and unlikely possibility. Let's imagine that this coronavirus had turned out to be something really dangerous. Let's suppose it had turned out to be something like the Spanish flu or the Black Death. And let's imagine that the only known cure, the only known preservative against this disease was a plant which grew in Ecuador. And let's suppose the Ecuadorian government passed an immediate law banning the export of this product and indeed restricting production. Well, the rest of the world will invade and take the necessary product, won't it? It's not a question of should the world do this, the world will do this. Because it is an existential threat not to. But for most purposes, if the Arabs and the Russians and whoever else nowadays producing the stuff wants to play around with the price of oil, that's their business. May even be a certain advantage to it. I'm no kind of dream for the avoidance of doubt. But as a libertarian, I don't like these long supply chains which require a great deal of external stabilization for, for the past hundred years first the british then the americans then the british and the americans and various other people have invaded the middle east and turned it upside down mm -hmm. because we needed we needed the oil to keep flowing we needed it so badly that it meant putting el presidente in power who murdered fifty thousand people a week we would look the other way. And you, you, need, you, you, you need control of the seas so the oil keeps moving. And then, of course, you need these large distribution networks to get the oil around. And this, of course, raises up a need for a large and powerful government. And so the rise of an oil-based economy has coincided with and has, in some degree, helped to bring about a world of big governments. And so if OPEC were to raise the price of oil to $150 a barrel and keep it there, it would in the short term be deeply inconvenient. But if it moved us towards more locally produced and non-distributed electricity and other energy, then that would be a good thing. Something, something that I do look forward to is a world in which everybody will have in the kitchen, under the sink, something about the size of a shredding machine, which every month you top up with some cheap fluid, and it provides you with all the unlimited electricity that you need. <laughs> I don't know how this will work, but the idea yeah. of home-produced electricity. Mm. Now, once you do that, you can shut your door on the world. Right. If you yeah. want, at the moment, even in America, if you want to go off-grid, you do go off-grid because you don't get, well, your lights don't come on. Right. Yeah, exactly. All right. All right. So our next question is, um, what is your opinion on Thomas Hobbes' theory of the Leviathan state? There is a lot to be said for Hobbes. He was a cold realist. There are many philosophers who talk about this should be, this ought to be. We have, an, we have a clear natural right to X, Y, or Z. And Thomas Hobbes said, there are no rights, there are no obligations, there is simply the will to power. And if somebody wants to do something and is able to do it, then he will do it. It is useful to know how the world works. 
once you know how the world does work, you will then be in a position to decide how you would like the world to work and how you move the world towards where you want to be. But I'm afraid talking about inalienable natural rights. What does Thomas Hobbes say? Covenants without swords. You wave a piece of paper at the police who are smashing your front door down and they laugh at it. Right. What did Mao say? Power grows out of the barrel of a gun, which is not strictly true, but it's... I, I think Mao had a rather better understanding of the world than many Western moral philosophers have had. Okay. Um, what's your uh, opinion on, like, the um, modern the modern libertarians of like England, like the um, Benjamin Carl, I think his name is right. Or yeah. Who? Oh, okay. Um, he, uh, you might know my different name online. Uh, Sarah and Makad, maybe. In England. Yes. There's a um, English YouTuber who is like a classical liberal. He ran for um, British parliament or not British parliament, the EU parliament under UKIP like a couple of years ago. Are you talking about Nigel Farage? No, I'm not talking about Nigel, Nigel Farage. He has worked with Nigel Farage, though. Mm. Just... You need to bear in mind that there are quite a few British libertarians. Mm -hmm. And although I remain active in the movement, I'm not as active as I once was. I don't travel out to meet people very much nowadays. And I do spend most of my life as a teacher. And so I don't have the same time for networking as I once had. Right. However, my belief about the British Libertarian Movement is that it presently barely exists. You have a number of supposedly libertarian or free market institutes based in London. You'll find, without exception, I think, that these are largely money-making operations they may the, the occasional free market solution may come out of them may be adopted by governments for reasons other than a commitment to libertarian principle but the idea for most of the free market or libertarian institutes of which i have personal knowledge is to provide a market in which special interest groups meet politicians and provide the usual incentives for them to do favours for the special interests. They are, they are trading floors for favours. Occasion, I'm not saying that there are no libertarians working for such institutions, but I don't think that the advancement of liberty is one of the main objectives of these organisations. And they, this really describes most of the British Libertarian Movement, which means that by my standards, the British Libertarian Movement might as well not exist at the moment. It's me and a few dozen friends. There may be a few dozen, there may be some more friends who I don't yet know about, but it's not a large and a vibrant movement. And many of us are getting rather elderly nowadays. And in my case, I'm extraordinarily busy doing other things, so I'm not as active as I used to be. Thank you. Um, yeah, that that pretty much answers my question. Yeah. Um, um, well, thank you for your time. We're running out of time actually because we couldn't have the uh, the guy that normally hosts it host it because he has like the Zoom Pro thing. Uh. Yeah. So um, if you'd like to do this again. Uh, if you're ever free, just message me. Um, thank you, God. Thank you for everybody who asked questions. Thank you, Mr. Gab, for for coming here for uh, to spend your time with us today. Not at all. Any time at all. all. Right. Okay. So thank you for having. Thank you for having had the patience to sit through me for forty minutes, and <laughs> I wish you a very happy afternoon.
Thank you. Thank you. Okay, bye. Bye.